Everything in Seven Stories by Andy Jones. Narrated by the author. Story one, Antidote. Part one. The rocking of the subway car was slowly sending Lucy to sleep. She didn't care. Sleep was all she craved now, but she knew she couldn't just yet. Her journey wasn't quite done. She still had to walk five blocks and couldn't do that last bit while half asleep. It wasn't sleep so much as weariness. Weariness and a general malaise. In many ways, the lethargy had been with her since Justin left her over a year ago. She knew it was coming. The telltale signs that he wanted out had been on the cards for six months or more, and she was surprised by how indifferent she felt when it actually happened. She had come home a little early that afternoon. The magazine publisher she worked at had to be evacuated. A fire alarm had gone off on the 14th floor, and as it was four o'clock, her boss said the whole staff could go home. It wouldn't be much before five before the fire department gave them the all clear anyway. Suddenly, with extra time on her hands, she had wandered down to Borders on 114th Street and picked up a couple of books on Paris. She'd been going on to Justin for months about making the trip out there, and he'd been helping her plan their big adventure. Every other week she'd find a brochure or sightseeing book and buy it on impulse. Three days ago for her birthday, Justin had bought her the Rosetta Stone Teach Yourself French DVD and a dictaphone. She was going to start picking up the lingo that weekend. Europe. Maybe there the two of them could correct their life course. They had been growing increasingly distant from each other, and both knew it. But a different scene, outside of the city, maybe that was what they needed to reaffirm what was important. She got back to their little apartment at around quarter to five. The sun was still just about visible in the sky, and it was casting a strong orange hue over the public baseball park on the eastern edge of Central Park. Their apartment was two blocks away from the park, and you could just about see a slither of green from the kitchen window. Their Beiju Central Park residence, as they called it when they first moved in, back when they both used to smile a lot more. As soon as she opened the front door, she saw his two suitcases blocking the entrance. She had to awkwardly sidestep them just to squeeze in. It wasn't that her heart sank or anything, but she knew right away and immediately felt tired. She languidly dumped her two Parisian guidebooks into the hallway metal waste paper basket. She hadn't even seen him yet, but already understood that she wouldn't need them anymore. He must have heard the door close because he walked out almost immediately into the hall with his laptop case around his shoulder. You're home early, he said. She mocked a smile. Caught in the act? He looked at the ground and nodded. And aside from a few references to him being out of her hair in just a few minutes, never spoke another word. And she didn't need to hear anything. After all, this was so clearly inevitable. Maybe if they'd gone away sooner it wouldn't be. But they had left it too late and procrastinated too long. After he left, she was precise and methodical. She went through all his stuff and placed it in trash bags, all labelled and sealed with twist sticks. She texted him that she'd got it all ready for him. And by eight o'clock that night, he texted back, Thanks, I'll come round and get it tomorrow. Within two weeks, she had signed up to an online dating website that Tracy at work used, and over the last year or so, Lucy had been on 27 different dates with 24 different men, but none of them really mattered. Tracy assured her that this was a numbers game and she'd find someone eventually. And sitting on the subway car, with the clatter and rhythm of the train's slow but steady movement nearly causing her to nod off, Lucy figured it was time to give the dating thing a rest. Tonight's date, Neil, was the straw to break the camel's back. All night he just talked about himself and checked out the ass of the waitress, and at the end of the night insisted in the most bullish way possible that he picked up the whole bill despite Lucy's best efforts to insist on going Dutch. 
Why do men always insist on that? Don't they get it? We don't want to be obligated to you. She had made it clear that they wouldn't be going back to his place and with a kiss on the cheek and an indifferent wave goodbye, she turned her back on him and headed straight for the subway. Poor Neil left her stand there like another loser. She felt a little bad about that, but not bad enough to give him another moment's consideration. None of the men she had seen since Justin deserved more than a second thought. In fact, she hadn't even thought about Justin for months until just now. Was he the reason she wasn't happy with her life? Was she still clinging on to the idea of their relationship? Was that why she had such a hard time moving on? Then she realized at once that the answer was no. After Justin left, I didn't even cry once. Alan was the final obstacle between Lucy and the salvation of her front door. He was sweet enough, but the total embodiment of a wet sponge. That said, even when she got to the top of the stairs and saw him sitting out on the hallway, she couldn't begrudge him a few moments of kindness. Not Alan, of all people. He was staring out of the communal window, but with the lights on and it being so dark outside, he must have only been able to see his own reflection. He had a bud in his hands, which he'd clearly barely taken a sip of, and was leaning forward on an old stool he always wheeled in from his kitchen. His front door was ajar. Lucy tapped him lightly on the shoulder, and he came out of his spell and met her gaze with a broad, if not slightly sheepish, smile. Hey, Lucy. How did the big day go? It went. He nodded. He was used to hearing about her failure. He held up his bud. You want one? No, I think I'm just going to hit the hay tonight. Alan was clearly disappointed at losing the chance of some adult company, but managed to stifle his disappointment with another broad smile. (laughs) Sure thing, no problem. Have a good night. While Lucy felt no remorse at terminating her date abruptly with Neil that night, cutting things short with Alan always gave her a pang of guilt. But she was too tired to indulge him tonight. She'd pop around and see him tomorrow after work to make up for it. She felt so sorry for Alan. She was really close friends with his wife Sarah, and then Alan's world came crashing down about three months ago when Sarah died, giving birth to their only child, little Lewis. Suddenly, Alan found himself a daddy for the first time, with no one around to support him. Lucy did what she could, and Alan clearly deeply appreciated it. She didn't know much about either his or Sarah's family, but didn't see much of anyone come and see him after Sarah died. Initially, he was a total wreck, and Lucy wondered if he'd end up doing something crazy. But after the first week, he seemed to accept his new responsibilities, and took them on with full vigour. There was no doubt that he loved Lewis, and that wasn't surprising. Lewis had both his mother's eyes and her smile. Lucy would often babysit for Alan, and let him go out for a bit. He would tell her that he was going to catch a movie and would be gone for a couple of hours. But really, Lucy knew he was just going to sit alone on a bench in Central Park and cry. He just didn't want to do that in front of his baby boy. For Sarah's sake, if nothing else, Lucy was not going to let Alan and little Lewis crumble. She'd gotten into her PJs and curled up with half a glass of wine, remnants from a bottle in the fridge from the night before, and noticed something nesting in a pile of magazines that she hadn't seen for months. The Rosetta Stone Teach Yourself French DVD. She put it in the laptop and watched as the program told her that the red apple was a rouge pomme. She tried to copy the pronunciation, speaking it into the dictaphone Justin had bought her, then playing it back to herself. She would still go to Paris. Maybe next year. Maybe. It was less than an hour after she had gotten home, and Lucy found herself lying in bed at 9.30 in the evening, with the TV still on to distract her thoughts. But her thoughts weren't going away. Part 2. The TV was on, but it wasn't loud. Alan wasn't paying any real attention to it anyway. Whenever little Lewis was there, things were easier. 
He had things to do, feeding, putting him to bed, nappy changing, but when Lewis wasn't there, Alan only had his own thoughts and he didn't want them to occupy his time. It was the afternoons that were the worst. Lewis was at the baby nursery and Alan was alone. It wasn't so bad at night. Aside from Lewis waking up every few hours, Alan was so exhausted that he could sleep whenever his head hit the pillow. And he wasn't dreaming. It was like his mind knew that dreaming would hurt too much. Sarah. Alan used to lie awake next to her, wondering how she was even possible. He had convinced himself that he was the only man in the world who knew that she was the greatest woman alive. Everything about her was special, perfect, and the fact that others couldn't see it just made him even more special. It was like he had a secret that no one else knew, and he was so happy and content just to keep it to himself. But now she was gone. It hurt so badly that no one else knew how exceptional she was. The smartest, funniest, and most beautiful woman on earth has died, and I'm the only one in the world who understands how awful that truth really is. He had stopped crying for her over a month ago. After two months of weeping, his tears had run dry. He had started to talk to her in his head. He hadn't told anyone, of course, they would have found it weird, or even worse, pretended to understand. He would tell her at first just how badly he missed her, that he hoped he would see her soon. But after a while, he knew that couldn't happen, not yet. He had responsibilities, Sarah's baby, his son, Lewis. Lewis reminded Alan of Sarah so much, he would tell her, sometimes just a whisper at night, of how beautiful and perfect this little man was. Lewis was so much like Sarah, the eyes, the way his nose wrinkles up whenever he giggled, and that it was almost too painful for Alan to bear. Sarah's mother, Julie, had been around several times. She didn't seem to be that taken to Lewis right away. After all, this was the baby that ended her daughter's life. Alan felt the same at first, but looking at Lewis... It was almost like Sarah was still there, and that was keeping him going. Finally, two weeks ago, Sarah's mother offered to take care of Lewis. You shouldn't be burdened so much while you grieve, she told him. We're doing fine, Alan replied. He knew that if he agreed to let Lewis go, even on a temporary basis, he'd never live with his son again. He just knew it. Julie never really liked the fact that a wonderful, perfect daughter wasted her time on a loser like Alan. She never understood the love that both of them shared, and now, a few months after her death, Alan had the only thing left about Sarah that Julie cared about, her grandson Lewis. Alan realised fairly soon into his relationship with Sarah that neither of her parents really knew her that well. They were just another two people in Sarah's life who didn't understand how special she was, but Alan knew, and he still held on to that. The TV was still on CNN headline. The main topic seemed to be the escalation to war with Britain and Brazil. Britain and Brazil? When the hell did that happen? Alan, for obvious reasons, hadn't been following the news over the last few months. The news anchor said there was some posturing on both sides, something to do with a trade embargo. The United Nations and the new US president, Joe Fisher, were getting involved to try and prevent a military conflict. Alan switched it off. Why had he even bothered to put on the news in the first place? Maybe just to offset his own misery. He looked at the clock on the kitchenette wall. It was one of those retro clocks Sarah bought from the gypsy market in Brooklyn last summer. It had a cat's face on top whose eyes would swivel from left to right in time with the second hand. Alan had told her that it creeped him out, which seemed to make Sarah love it even more. As a joke, he'd sometimes take it off the wall and hide it somewhere in the apartment. After an hour or two, she'd notice it was gone and would chase him around the apartment and interrogate him until he confessed where it was hidden. Her interrogation technique usually involved a combination of tickling and tweaking his nose. 
once he'd given in and told her. They'd lie together on the rug, holding each other so closely. He'd kiss her neck and she'd whisper in his ears things he wouldn't hear any more. He'd never move that clock off the wall again. He snapped out of his daydream to focus on the time. 2.30pm. He'd have to go and pick up Lewis from the baby nursery in about an hour. Maybe he could get his head down for a bit beforehand. Sarah's parents had insisted on paying for a special nursery service for Lewis. At three months old, Alan thought that was a little extreme, but they found a place that would take him simply to give Alan a rest and personal time twice a week. Alan disliked the whole idea. He had to get Lewis out there for good sooner than later. It was an exclusive baby nursery that didn't take children above two years old, but you could leave them there pretty much from birth. It was full of rich kids whose caesarean section mothers, too posh to push, would dump their children at the earliest opportunity so they could get back in the gym immediately and regain their impeccable figures within weeks. They all had nannies at home to do the icky stuff, and they would only hold their children or show any affection if people were coming around in order to keep up appearances. Sarah had come from a family just like that, a family of wealth and privilege, yet with no real feeling whatsoever. Despite this, somehow she had managed to rise above it all and be so much better than all of them. The smartest, funniest, most beautiful woman on earth has died, and I'm the only one in the world who understands how awful that truth really is. The phone jolted him out of his darkness only after the third ring. It was Barbara, the assistant carer who worked at the nursery Lewis attended. For just a moment, Alan wondered if he'd missed four o'clock and they were wondering why he hadn't been to pick Lewis up. I don't want you to panic, she told him, clearly panicking herself in the process. But there's been a problem. Please get here as soon as you can. Something terrible is happening to Lewis. Part 3 The harsh halogen lights from the emergency room walls made it harder for Alan to piece his thoughts together. It seems like he had been a mere passenger in the events of the afternoon, passively letting himself be taken through all that had occurred. Now he was trying to regain control. He had ran the whole 12 blocks to the bright infant's nursery, only to be stunned into a state of stillness when he finally saw Lewis. His beautiful baby boy was screaming as hard as his little lungs could take, beyond that even, and his face was growing purple and blotchy. Barbara, the assistant carer of the nursery, grabbed hold of Alan's arm. It was only a minute or so later that he realised she did it for support, his legs caving underneath him. In the 15 minutes since she called him, she had taken the time to calm herself and could now try to do the same to Alan. It's okay, Alan, really. Kids pick up viruses all the time, and I'm sure that's what this is. This is the sort of thing that builds up their immune system long term. Alan used her shoulder to stand up properly and went down to pick up Lewis. I'm not sure you should do that, Barbara said. What he's got might be catching. As far as Alan was concerned, that was irrelevant. He's my son. He rested Lewis's head against his chest. My God, he's burning up something awful, and bobbed him up and down, gently patting his back, doing all he could to calm him. Nothing was working. Alan noticed that the other children were in a separate room. What was going on? Why was Lewis left alone like this? He turned to ask Barbara when he noticed that Gloria had just stepped into the main entrance. Gloria was the boss of the nursery. She was the snotty woman that had vetted Alan, or it seemed that way at the time, about accommodating Lewis into her nursery. Some nursery. It's just a place where stuck-up Central Park elites dump their newborn children. She had asked all sorts of questions about where they lived, raising a condescending eyebrow when she realised Alan's street address number had three figures, but she was willing to take the money from Sarah's parents, and so Lewis was accepted. Gloria rushed into the room, curiously disappointed that Alan had already arrived. Why was that? Oh, Mr. Webb, you're here already. What's happened to my son? Now, as I said to Barbara, I'm sure it's just a virus of some kind. Nothing for you to worry about at all. We have an excellent on-call medical staff who will be here in moments, and I'm positive that your little one will be just fine. What medical staff? 
Alan hadn't ever heard about that. Oh, just an added service we provide. We don't like to talk about it that much because it often worries parents of newborns, but the security of knowing that the very best medical help is available whenever needed puts the minds of some parents at rest. Alan was sure that pediatric care was not included in the services of such a small and exclusive nursery, but if it could help relieve poor little Lewis's discomfort, he was more than happy to make use of it. A couple of paramedics arrived and were buzzing at the front desk. Alan, Barbara and Gloria all turned at once. Gloria seemed surprised to see them. Barbara went to let them in, explaining to Gloria at the same time, Sorry, I didn't know about the medical care thing. I just panicked and dialed 911. Just seconds later, both paramedics had Lewis lying back on a pillow, still bawling his eyes out. Gloria was telling them that it wasn't anything to worry about too much and that she was so sorry that their time was wasted. They didn't seem to think their time was wasted. Both were talking quickly to each other in a medical language that Alan didn't understand, but he could make out enough to know that it was serious. Within minutes, they had brought out a toddler stretcher and were taking Lewis into the back of the paramedic van. Alan rode along with them, leaving behind a stunned Barbara and a very upset Gloria. Why didn't Gloria want them to take Lewis away, he thought. When one of the paramedics says, we've got to get him to the pediatric unit now, why did she protest too much? Is that really necessary, she said? Something wasn't right, but Alan didn't know what. Before he could let that thought linger, he caught sight of the doctor who was treating Lewis walking, more like running, past. Before Alan could even open his mouth to ask a question, the doctor had already spun past him, calling a nurse for something. He wasn't ignoring Alan. He looked too concerned to be talking to anyone. Oh, Jesus, what's happening to my baby boy? There was no one to speak to, no one to turn to. Sarah's parents were skiing in Aspen, their grief at the recent loss of their daughter not too troublesome to put off their annual vacation there. He had left a message on cell phones, but no one had gotten back to him. Then he remembered the one person who might be around. Lucy. He picked up the phone, praying that she'd answer. Over the phone, Lucy thought that Alan was over-exaggerating. Since Sarah died, he panicked over the silliest, littlest thing, especially where Lewis was concerned. Despite promising herself that she wouldn't, she had gone back onto the dating site in the morning and had another suitor lined up that night. She figured that if this thing with Lewis dragged on, she'd have to cancel just because her neighbour was being so characteristically lame. That all changed once she saw Lewis. There was some kind of ventilation tube in his mouth and a little one up his nose. She saw an IV drip hooked up to him and even though he was resting, she could see his chest rising and falling faster than was surely normal. Several medical staff of some kind or other ran around him, taking blood samples and holding up charts. She held Alan tightly as he broke down in tears. At least she was with him to give him support. What was happening? Detective second grade Prince Johnson hated hospitals. The smell of Clorox hung around and made him feel nauseous. In his line of work, he had to go to the hospital and question people all the time, and he always wanted to leave quickly. Homicide detectives were more comfortable dealing with death after the fact rather than having it happening right in front of them. This made him especially unwilling when a pediatric doctor asked him to attend a meeting with the father of a very poorly baby. Sir, I'm busy here. Can't you just give him the bad news yourself? The doctor looked a little sheepish. I I wouldn't normally ask, but this guy was on his own and looks a little... unstable. I don't want to be trouble if I have to give him bad news. Detective Johnson sighed. It was going to be a few minutes before the nurse let him speak to his own suspect anyway. A stupid-ass ingrate tried to hold up a deli on 104th Street that afternoon, making off with less than 60 bucks before tripping over his own getaway car door, letting out a shot from an old Colt 45 and killing his own cousin, the getaway driver. In the process, the suspect hit his head against the side of the door in the fall, requiring 13 stitches. Okay, the detective said, as long as it's quick. As Detective Johnson followed the doctor up to the poor father, he noticed that he now had company anyway. He hung around behind as the doctor broke the bad news. I'm so sorry, said the doctor. For a minute, Alan thought he was going to black out. Is my son dead? 
We've got Lewis stable for now, he went on, but he won't stay that way for long. We've just had the toxicology report back. There was a beat. The doctor seemed uncomfortable at the thought of explaining what the report revealed. Alan didn't know what to say, but Lucy squeezed his hand a little tighter and then asked for him, What's wrong with him? The doctor took a slow intake of breath. We're not entirely sure. I I don't think any of us have seen anything quite like it. Your son seems to have picked up a virus of some kind. We're not quite sure what to call it. All we know is, with the chemical mix at the moment, it has the capacity to be very crippling. If there were some way of treating it and treating it soon, it might be perfectly fine. But at the rate that it's spreading through his central nervous system, we believe in 72 hours it will spread to the brain. And we don't expect him to live much past that. The couple hadn't really seemed to notice that he was there, but Detective Johnson still waited for a respectful moment, then slowly walked away back towards his suspect. It was pretty messed up, but it didn't seem like the father was going to make any kind of scene. Anyway, Johnson was murder police, and this wasn't his problem. But still, poor son of a bitch. Part 4 The director looked out over Central Park from his executive office. At this time in the afternoon, the shadows grew longer as the sun prepared to set. He could just about make out a little league baseball game playing in one of the pitches on the east side, the lake just visible beyond. He had often stared down on this near-perfect sight for hours, engrossed in people-watching, seeing thousands of New Yorkers like little ants all going about their daily business. Seeing the hive of productivity and motion was usually soothing, but not this afternoon. Sir? The director didn't turn around. He knew the voice. His chief assistant, Michael. Do you have any good news for me? I'm sorry, but no. The director exhaled. He knew that there would always be the possibility of something terrible happening to his most valuable of projects. They had often complicated it. Those in the government who sanctioned his plans were quick to talk of collateral damage and fallout that we can deal with. But for the director... This was not acceptable. He wanted no one harmed, especially not children. But now it had happened. Collateral damage. The director finally turned his attention to Michael, nodding for him to dish out the details. Michael swallowed hard before starting. The baby had been infected. Our people administered the dose two hours before. They were going to come back within the hour when some... Part-time worker in the nursery panicked and called the baby's father, not before calling 911, though. The director sat down behind his pristine desk and gestured Michael to carry on. Paramedic Eunuch was called out. Of course, once they'd seen the condition of the child, they rushed him straight away to hospital. What are our options now? Options, sir? Can we send over an antidote? Discreetly, of course. Michael looked at the floor for a moment. As of right now, I'm not sure that's possible. The hospital, every paediatrician in the place, they're pouring over this baby. Obviously, the illness is nothing like they've ever seen before. Frankly, we're lucky that it's not a media frenzy, too. But that will almost certainly happen in the next hour or so. And as they analyse the child, will anything come back on us? Oh, no, nothing, sir. Michael seems slightly relieved to at least have some good news for the director. It'll just seem like some kind of virus... The baby will be under quite a bit of discomfort for the next few days, but in the end should pass quite peacefully. The director sat back in his chair, thinking, No one will know it was us. At least that was something. Also, we've contained the situation in the nursery, sir. We shouldn't have any trouble there. And what about the woman, the the one who runs that place? Oh, uh, Gloria won't talk. We've taken her through the protocols already and she's primed for the press. I've spoken to her personally. I can assure you she won't be a problem. The director thought for a moment. Keep an eye on her anyway. Michael nodded and as the director swiveled his seat around to face the window, Michael quietly left him to his own thoughts. The director looked back out over Central Park. He started to feel better. He could justify things again. This is necessary, he thought, for the well-being of humanity. There's too much at stake. Alan had taken to pacing up and down in the paediatric waiting room of the hospital. Lucy could see what was going on. 
Alan felt useless, powerless to help his own son. There's something going on here, Lucy. I just, I just can't figure it out. She nodded. The TV in the waiting room had MY1 on. They were reporting from outside the hospital. Seeing the paramedic van leaving the nursery with sirens wailing that afternoon had caused a bit of a stir in the neighborhood. It seemed that that had led to someone calling a local TV network and it had brought them to the hospital where an anonymous member of the medical team had confirmed a baby from the bright infant's nursery had come down with some sort of quote-unquote exotic illness. They had filmed all the frightened, wealthy parents taking their kids out of the nursery and bundling them into the back of their Cadillacs and BMWs, looking both concerned and immaculate at the same time. Then they had a previously recorded interview with Gloria, the owner of the nursery. She looked incredibly flustered, unsurprising really, but tried to maintain some level of calm. Of course, myself and all the staff here at Bright Infants are deeply concerned and very upset about the awful illness that one of our children seems to have required. However, we've had a toxicology team from the Marvelax Corporation kindly volunteer to come in and do a thorough examination of the nursery as part of their local community investment program. I can assure you that we have no dangerous infectious materials here. Once it was clear the child in question was ill, we simply isolated him from the rest of the children. So where do you think the exotic virus came from? Asked one off-screen reporter. Yeah, I couldn't really speculate. Gloria seemed a little more flustered. But if I were to guess, I would say that this may have been something that he picked up at home. But of course, we understand the concerns of all our parents of bright infants. So we've decided to close the nursery down for a few days. And we invite the state to come and provide whatever examinations into our cleanliness and standards they wish. The picture quality of the TV in the hospital was poor. But that didn't stop both Alan and Lucy picking up on something about Gloria. It wasn't that she was nervous. Of course she would be. It was something else. He didn't pick up any bug at home, said Alan, mostly to himself. Lucy got off the couch and stood next to him. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that she's not telling the whole truth, but I don't know why. Lucy looked up at him. They stared at each other for a moment. Well, she said, there's only one way to know for sure. It was getting pretty dark around the nursery. The media frenzy had died down to the point of non-existence. Alan and Lucy waited for the last TV satellite truck to pack up and go before crossing the street to the front door of Bright Infants. Before knocking, Alan instinctively just went for the handle. To his surprise, it opened. It was dark inside. With the sun practically set and without the orange glow that remained in the sky, the nursery was murky. Both Alan and Lucy seemed to know, on gut feeling, not to talk. Someone else was there in the nursery, but they didn't want to announce themselves just yet. Despite the gloom, Alan could see that a quick clean-up job had taken place that afternoon. The walls were scrubbed to the point that they shined. He could smell the sting of disinfectant. Seemed like the nursery was covering its tracks in case they were accused of having an unclean environment to accommodate kids. Lucy spotted a thin strip of light coming from the back office. They both looked at each other. Someone was in there, and they knew that the only way to get answers was to go in. Alan opened the door slowly. Gloria was sitting behind her desk. It took Alan and Lucy a moment to adjust their eyes to the glare from the harsh fluorescent lighting. Gloria didn't seem faced to see them. She had an open bottle of Jack Daniels on her desk, nearly half empty. Her eyeliner smudged. She'd been crying. Alan walked up to the desk, thinking, I need answers. She spoke before he had a chance to. It was barely a whisper, but he heard it. I'm so sorry. What are you sorry about? What did you do to my son? They they promised me. They promised. What do you mean? Promise what? They said it was, it was so unlikely that any of the children would be hurt. I mean, not, not permanently. Who said that? You, you have to understand, it wasn't about the money at all. That wasn't the point. We were, we were doing good. Real good for the world. What good? Who promised you kids wouldn't be hurt? What did you do to my son? As Alan asked the last question, he hadn't noticed Gloria taking the thirty-eight snub-nosed revolver out of a desk drawer. But Lucy did. 
She didn't even have time to call out to Alan before Gloria pressed the gun up against her own temple and fired. (laughs) Part 5. After so many years on the job, Detective Johnson could figure out pretty much everything on instinct alone. He had a fairly good idea of what had happened and why before he had even got to the bright infant's nursery. And after looking around the crime scene and interviewing the two witnesses, his instincts were totally confirmed. He had finished his last cigarette and made a mental note to stop off at a drugstore before going back home that night. Thankfully, this homicide had taken him off the rotation and he could spend a few good days going through the motions before he blackballed it as a suicide. There'd be the time it'd take for the forensic guys to put their report together, lazy bastards, not to mention the waiting time with the coroner. He wouldn't have to do much during that time, and at the end of it, he knew that the homicide would go from an unsolved red ball to a solved black ball, and he could do with more black ink. His conviction stats were down a little from his 62% solving rate of last year. Johnson had taken the call from his bed at 1am and was surprised to hear the chief on the end of the line. Normally, when you're on rotation, it was the shift captain who called. When it's the chief and it's one in the morning, you know things are a little more serious. You're up, Johnson. Detective Johnson recognised the chief's gravelly voice immediately, a harshness brought about by smoking 40 a day as much as anything else. Oh, what's the red ball, chief? Smith in your unit says you're at St. Patrick's Hospital today. Uh, yeah, Smith's the primary on a robbery homicide from this afternoon. A suspect was getting stitches. You seen that stuff on TV about the baby that's got the virus thing? Sure, they think it might have picked up something in the nursery. I saw the father when I was there, actually. He sat up in bed. You know, when that kid dies, if it turns out there was foul play, then I can see where we'd be involved, but the doctors seem to think it's just an infection. There's not really anything that could turn this into a murder investigation. Oh, there's a murder investigation, all right. Turns out this little story's turned into a homicide after all. On the way to the nursery, Detective Johnson ran the information through his head. He had it all figured out before he even pulled up amidst the flashing NYPD blue lights that surrounded the children's daycare center. The story had hit the news, and once a death had occurred in connection with the events of that day, there was enough clout to get the mayor worried. And if the mayor worried, the chief worried. And if the chief worried, that meant Johnson would get a call from him at one in the damn morning. But it was so obviously a straight suicide. All Johnson had to do was play things by the book and pick up some brownie points from the top brass along the way. The way he saw it, this Gloria woman who ran the nursery was horrified that a baby in her care had picked up some sort of life-threatening illness, and so she behaved irrationally. The fact that the father of the baby had confronted her probably pushed her over the edge and made her take her own life. He had spoken to both Alan and Lucy, his neighbour who had gone with him for support. They were understandably shaken up about what had happened, not just to Gloria, but to Alan's son as well. But Detective Johnson didn't see anything unreasonable in what they had told him. Yes, coming to the nursery that evening was probably a dumb thing to do, but this poor son of a bitch knew his son was a couple of days away from death. Anyone would be a little desperate in that circumstance. Alan couldn't be blamed for what Gloria did. Already the forensic guys were talking suicide. Detective Johnson spent a few minutes with the body as one of the uniforms from the 57th Precinct took pictures. Gloria had basically blown her own brains out. There was no bruising on her hands or arms which indicated that she had acted on her own impulse with no malice or force from a third party. Unless you count the half-finished bottle of Jack on her desk as a third party. He thought, sad situation... Baby picks up a nasty bug, the press gets hold of the story, and the OTT boss who's supposed to look after him takes her own life out of sheer desperate misery. Look, Johnson placed his hand on Alan's shoulders, looking over at Lucy, who was still shaking a little too. Both of you, go home. You did nothing wrong here. This shit is not on you, you understand? Rest up, go see your son tomorrow morning. Alan looked up at him, his face ravaged. But she knew something about my son. She said she was sorry and how they were trying to do good and how they said Lewis would be okay. I, I, I just need to know who these other people are that she's talking about. I can't... Slow down, sir. She was just saying we as in the nursery. There's no hexagonal six-degree conspiracy here. Just a really awful circumstance where a really nice yet emotional lady chose to take her own life. She chose poorly. Now, please, go home and be with your son in the morning. I'll take care of everything here. 
By three in the morning, Alan was finally fast asleep on the couch in his apartment with his head on Lucy's lap. She knew there was no chance of her sleeping during what was left of that night and there was no way that she'd let Alan be alone. The whole night had turned into a surreal blur. She needed to be awake so her brain could process everything that had gone on. And there was something else, something that she had always known but only just properly understood that night. Despite all the dates and pointless twee relationships, Alan and little Lewis were the only men she actually cared about. And unlike a string of relationship failures, and the men in her family like her father, who was certainly no picnic, Alan and Lewis both stumbled into her life. And they mattered to her now more than anything. She didn't quite understand in what way they mattered, but knew she couldn't rest until they knew the truth about what had happened. After Gloria took her own life, Alan and Lucy both stood there for a moment in shock. The gunshot was so loud and they didn't know what to do. Then, after the first few moments had passed, Alan started looking around the office, almost frantically for something. Alan, what what are you doing? I don't know. Looking. For, for what? Don't touch anything. We need to call the cops. We will, but not before I find something to give me answers. Alan, please. No, someone's put my son in danger. Do you understand? And all afternoon, men in authority have told me that there's nothing that could be done that is all so terribly unfortunate. Well, I don't want to wait for more men in uniforms to tell me that this is so unfortunate and nothing could be done here either. If they won't get answers, I will. I, I can't... I can't be here with you for this. I'm going to call the cops, Alan. But Lucy knew she really just needed to get out of that room, away from the blood and the horror. Once she was out of the office and out of the nursery, she took a few deep, deep breaths. Was she going to be sick? No, it passed. She let herself have another moment and then called 911. She couldn't believe how right Alan was. The homicide police officer who gave them his car, Detective Johnson, wasn't interested in hearing anything they had to say. He didn't even seem to want to hear Gloria's last words. It was like he had already concluded events in his own mind and had only wanted to hear things that backed up his hunches. It was only when they got back to the apartment just before 2am that Lucy realised what Alan had done. I took Gloria's cell phone. You did what? Why? You heard that asshole detective. They're not going to investigate this. They're going to sweep it all away. Just another suicide. The press will grow tired in a day or two. They'll never find out what happened to my son. She had made modest attempts to condemn what he did, but she knew he was right. That wasn't just another suicide. There was something else going on, and no one seemed to care. It was nearly four o'clock. It would be getting lighter soon. Alan was still fast asleep with his head in her lap. Lucy stared at Gloria's iPhone, laid out on the coffee table. There weren't many numbers saved in the address book, and her call history consisted mostly of calls to the nursery's office, with one or two other calls to the retirement home that they learned Gloria's mother resided in. But five minutes before Gloria had turned up to the nursery to see Alan and poor baby Lewis, and less than ten minutes after they had left in the back of the ambulance, she had made a call to a specific number, and everything about that number disturbed Alan and Lucy to the bone. Part 6. They had gone through Gloria's iPhone and found nothing of interest. The notes app on Gloria's iPhone only had one saved note that simply said WA54848. Alan had looked up most of the numbers on Gloria's phone online and could track who they belonged to, but he couldn't understand why she had called the Marvelox Corporation. Their headquarters overlooked the southernmost tip of Central Park, an incredible building in its own right, but dwarfed by the larger, more impressive skyscrapers flanking it on either side. It was huge and imposing, yet totally discreet and anonymous. Why had Gloria called these people? Marvelox were known all over the world. It had risen from relative obscurity to become one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. It was like the medicinal version of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. The majority shareholder was the government. 
It started as a federal government program to expand government research into curing a whole variety of illnesses before being sectioned off as a quasi-private entity in its own right. The Conservatives in D.C. liked it because it seemed like a private entity no longer bogging down taxpayers, and the Liberals liked it because it was not like those nasty, fully private, profit-seeking medical corporations. This was one mostly supported and guided by Uncle Sam. The Libertarians hated it, saying that it was a corporatist-socialist hybrid, the worst of both worlds, but with the slight exception of the new president, people didn't listen to Libertarians anymore. Nearly every home in America had something produced by the Marvelox Corporation in their medicine cabinet, even if they didn't know it. There was a division of children's healthcare products, senior citizen medicine, aids to boost waning sexual performance, and much more. You just had to look pretty close at the bottle sometimes before you could see the little blue logo that said, part of the Marvelox family. After spending the morning with little Lewis in hospital, his condition getting no better, he was stable, but that wouldn't last for many more days, Alan paid the Marvelox building a visit. The lady on reception had her hair pulled back into a painfully tight bun, painted eyebrows that seemed to feign surprise, and enough perfume that it made Alan's eyes sting. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to Marvelox. How can I help you today? She sounded wooden and perfunctory like she said it the same way a thousand times a day. I need to speak with someone. Someone in charge. She rolled her eyes. We ask that all complaints and customer inquiries are either submitted online or by our telephone helpline. I have the number here if you want to... No, I don't want to complain. I just need to speak to somebody. You are speaking to somebody, sir. Can I be of assistance? He wasn't getting anywhere. He just had to come out with it. I need to speak to somebody concerning my son. He was poisoned and is going to die soon, and I think the Marvelox Corporation is responsible. Her plastic death mask of a face giving nothing away, the receptionist discreetly pressed a button under her desk while leaning forward. I see, sir. Well, if you'll be kind enough to wait here for a few moments, someone who can assist you will be down momentarily. The director's chief assistant, Michael, saw the silent alarm trip on his desk. An unobtrusive red light flashed in front of him. He immediately turned on the CCTV and, using the touchscreen, opened up a digital window to see the reception. He could see the top of the receptionist's head. She turned and glanced up at the camera, knowing that someone would be watching her. Just to the other side of her desk, he saw Alan. Oh, damn it, it's him. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, sir, said Michael, unbuttoning his suit jacket and raising a hand to shake Alan's. The shake was pretty limp. Are you in charge? Well, I'm the chief assistant to one of our directors. How can I be of assistance? I need to talk to someone in charge about my son. He's dying. I'm so terribly sorry. You may have seen it on the local news. Oh, the child from the nursery. You have my deepest sympathies. If there's anything of a medical nature we can do to make your son more comfortable, free of charge, of course. No, I want to know what relationship you have with Gloria. Gloria? The woman who ran the nursery. She made calls to Marvelox yesterday when my son got ill. Why did she do that? Ah, I see. Well, actually, I can shed some light on that. You see, once word had gotten out that something terrible had happened in one of our local nurseries, we volunteered to do a biological audit of the premises. An inspection, if you will, just to make sure that nothing dangerous had happened there. I can assure you that our team found nothing. This is something we do often for local businesses and organizations in the community. It's just Our way of giving something back to New York. Yet I'm pretty positive that the owner of the nursery asked for our help. Maybe that's why she called us. If you like, I can get you a copy of the press release. The director sat in his office watching the CCTV feed, seeing Michael giving Alan all the patter. He was gently holding Alan by the arm and slowly escorting him out of the building. All smiles. Alan was timidly following Michael had done his job admirably once more, but the director still didn't feel right about it. Clearly, we'll need more drastic measures to end this one-man investigation. It was getting late again and Alan was still pacing in his apartment. Lucy had cooked them a little pasta, but he had barely eaten any of it. Something's 
just not right about that place, Lucy. I know it. How can you know? I just do. Just like I knew something was wrong about Gloria, the words that she'd said before she died. I mean, you heard her. She said she was promised none of the children would get hurt. Someone had persuaded her to do something, and I think that damn Marvelox Corporation knows more than they're letting on. Lucy got off the couch and faced Alan to stop him pacing, if nothing else. Look, if you're right, then there's only one thing left to do. Go see that Detective Johnson guy tomorrow morning. Just tell the truth about taking Gloria's phone, explain the place calls. He's a detective, he has to follow up on that. Johnson? He's convinced that there's nothing to this. He'll have already decided that there's a rational explanation to it all, and he'll just look into it long enough to find something that convinces him of that. It wouldn't hurt to try. Lucy was cut short as she noticed the vase on Alan's coffee table smash into a thousand pieces. Then the glass in front of the TV screen. Then the lamp. Stuffing was bursting out of the sofa. What was that loud popping? Oh my god! Gunshots! Out of sheer instinct, Alan pushed Lucy to the ground. Bullets burst through the windows. Holes ripped through the living room into the kitchen. The noise was unbearable. Lucy tried to scream, but only air came out. She closed her eyes and cowered. Then, as soon as it started, it was over. Light was pouring through the bullet holes from the kitchen. The curtains billowed as the wind cascaded in against what was left of the shattered windows. Lucy opened her eyes. She turned around, brushing away the few shards of glass that had landed on her while they were suddenly under siege. She turned to face Alan. He was leaning against the couch, breathing a little more heavily, clutching his chest, bleeding. Please, God, no. Not Alan. Not now. Lucy had bummed a cigarette off a nurse in the hospital. She quit smoking ages ago, but that didn't matter now. Nothing did. Nothing except my two men. She was watching ambulances pull up in front of the ER and rush people in. She'd counted seven just as she'd been standing there. The doctor told her that Alan had been very fortunate. The three nine-millimeter rounds that had entered his body had missed all of his vital organs and two went in and out. He'd be okay in a few days, but not fully fit for at least six months. Detective Johnson had been called in, of course, and it was just like Alan said it would be. He took notes, but mentioned that similar attacks with fully automatic rifles had taken place in that neighborhood four times in the last two years. Alan was right. Johnson thought this was some misinformed gangland shooting where they had picked the wrong apartment. The building across the street was vacant, so the gangbangers could just break in and open fire at will from across the street. Lucy made the decision then and there not to tell Detective Johnson about the calls to the Marvelox Corporation or any of it. He wouldn't listen anyway. He won't help me get the answers I need. I'm going to have to do it myself. She pulled out Gloria's iPhone. She had forgotten until that moment that she had left it in her jacket pocket for most of the day, unsure of what to do with it. She tapped on the Notes app again. That one note. WA-54848. She called the Marvelax Corporation number again, just like Alan did the night before. After one ring, a pleasant female automated voice started her patter. Welcome to the Marvelax Corporation. For customer comments, please press 1. For press inquiries, please press 2. To speak to a specific member of staff, please press 3. Lucy pressed 3. Please key in your five-digit extension number. Five digits? Lucy typed in the number from the note on the phone. Five, four, eight, four, eight. Thank you. We shall connect you now. The phone rang several times before Lucy heard that same woman on voicemail. You've reached the voicemail of William Adams, Director of Biological Advancement. Lucy thought, Director William Adams? W-A-54848? Of course, W-A is for William Adams. The voicemail continued. Director Adams' secretarial staff are not available at the moment, but if you leave your name, number, and nature of inquiry, one of the staff will be in touch as soon as possible. Lucy looked over at the entrance of the emergency room as another paramedic van pulled up, lights flashing. She waited for the beep before speaking. Director Adams, you probably don't know who I am. My name is Lucy Williams. I'm a friend of Alan Levy, the man whose son you've poisoned and the man one of your hired goons tried to kill tonight. 
Just wanted to let you know that I'm coming to see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. She hung up. Part 7 It was exactly 8.55 in the morning when Lucy entered the Marvelox Corporation's reception. She had barely slept that night, just dozing off occasionally by Alan's bedside. The nurse on shift that night could see in Lucy's eyes that the phrase visiting hours would not be appreciated. By 7 a.m., Lucy gently kissed a sleeping Alan on the forehead, whispering, Rest. I'm going to fix everything. She went back to her apartment, had a quick shower and put on a change of clothes. She looked at herself in the mirror. I'm ready. Michael was waiting in the lobby and knew Lucy the moment he saw her. She was out of place there, it was so obvious. The determination on her face gave her away. He knew what the director, William Adams, had asked of him. By the end of that morning, he'd have to be a killer once more. He had killed for Marvel Ox before, and before then he used to do it directly for the government. These days, Marvel Ox and the government were one in the same. The state controlled 68% of Marvel Ox stock on paper, but the rest of the business was divided up by state senators, members of the House of Representatives, and even some senior cabinet secretaries in the White House. Every time he took a life, he always believed that it was for the greater good of the country, the country that he swore to defend to the very end. Doing it for Marvel Ox or the state was the same thing. America, my adopted home, must be protected. If some must die to achieve that end, then so be it. Miss Williams, he asked with a smile. She turned to face him, slightly surprised to see such a friendly face ready to greet her. They had planned for my arrival. That means they think my presence here is dangerous. That means they have something to hide. They have already given themselves away. My name is Michael. Mr. Adams is waiting to speak to you personally. Please, come this way. He led her to an elevator, away from the others, past two sets of security cordons. This will take us directly to the executive suite, he said, apparently trying to be reassuring. Once they got inside, he swiped a card in the door and the elevator rapidly accelerated upward. Apologies in advance if your ears pop, he said. She waited a moment before speaking. Do you know I am here? Yes, Mr. Williams has kept me fully appraised of the situation, and he asked me to personally guarantee that you will hear nothing but the truth about what has happened and why. The bluntness of your message on the phone made the director understand that you're not to be played in any way. It's true, then. You poison Lewis? He smiled. Why would anyone smile at a question like that? Once you've heard from the director, everything will make sense. She wanted to ask more, but the elevator slowed very suddenly. The doors opened. Lucy could see right away the director, William Adams, leaning against a large glass desk. The whole room was made out of glass. An impressive vista over Central Park was sprawled out in the distance. Adams was almost completely bald. A grade two trim of white hair on the sides were all that remained. He looked battle-scarred. Age had certainly taken its toll on him. He was frowning up until the moment that he saw Lucy. Then a smile automatically wrapped around his face. The smile of a snake. Miss Williams, thank you for arriving so promptly, he said, checking his watch. In fact, you're still a couple of minutes early. She almost didn't want to step out of the elevator. Michael was holding the doors for her. She took a breath and stepped across the threshold. There was no going back now. Would you like something to drink? Adams asked. No, no thank you. I was told by your subordinate here that you were prepared to give me answers, the truth. That is all I want. Adams raised an eyebrow. Lucy was suddenly aware that Michael was directly behind her now, blocking her path back to the elevator should she suddenly wish to leave. Things just suddenly felt wrong. She walked closer to William Adams, almost too close, thinking this is what I've come for. The truth? Very well. He held up two clear plastic tubes, each with a slightly different label. This vial in my left hand contains a chemical called Paralox 4. At present, it's pretty nasty. It can incapacitate someone, make them very ill for 72 hours and more, but keep them stable. After 72 hours or thereabouts, they die. The vial in my right hand is the antidote. 
Within minutes of being given the antidote, you're completely cured. No side effects. The military and some of my friends on the hill seem to think this will be an effective weapon in the war on terror. I suppose if a man knows that he is certain to die, he may tell you everything you need to know, as long as you possess the power to give him his life back. Is this what you infected Lewis with? I'm afraid so. And deliberately, too. Lucy had to step back. She nearly felt her legs buckle. Be strong. A private medical corporation in Singapore created Parallax 4 completely by accident. They were working on a chemical compound that could attack cancerous cells in the body while leaving the perfectly healthy red and white blood cells alone. Once they realized the danger of this side product they created, they put all their efforts into creating an antidote, just in case it fell in the wrong hands. Noble of them, don't you think? Lucy said nothing. Anyway, US intelligence got wind of this drug and decided to take it for themselves without the president's knowledge. This current commander-in-chief is a little flaky, you see, so they decided it'd be best if he was out of the loop. Intelligence acquired the chemical knowledge to recreate Parallax 4 in our labs. Then all the resources and information that the Singapore company owned was destroyed in a fire. A very unfortunate accident. Many lives were lost, and the four scientists who knew how to recreate Parallax 4 all suffered unfortunate accidents or life-terminating illnesses over the preceding six months. Lucy could barely comprehend what Adams was saying, but she knew she hadn't got to the real truth yet. So, the CIA have their new little weapon. But for me, this chemical is infinitely more important. The scientists in Singapore were right, you know. Parallax 4 does have the power to cure cancer. But we're not quite there yet. We discovered fairly quickly that to accelerate the potential of this miracle drug, we would need to test it on humans. Animals won't do. The biological differences are too great. And not only that, but they need to be pure. That is to say, unsullied by all the different medical issues that most of us grow to have in our lives. So you wanted to test it on babies? Lucy could barely believe. She was even asking. Not wanted, Miss Williams. Needed. It was the only way to be sure that we were progressing in the right direction. Now, in the free market here in the West, you can't just snatch up children. We're not monsters. And yes, you can do it in the third world, but there's too much disease of all sorts. It would hamper the objectivity of our trials. So what did you do? We cut a deal with Gloria at the Bright Infants Nursery. She had money troubles, and we told her that as well as giving her some financial security, she'd be doing a lot of good for the world if she let our medical teams discreetly infect some of the children with Parallax 4. After an hour or two, they'd come back to the nursery and do some tests on the subjects and see how it was working. Then every baby infected would be treated with the antidote and restored to full health. The parents... And even the children themselves would never even know what happened, or that they just played a vital role in saving the lives of millions. But but what happened with Lewis? She heard her own voice waver slightly. It was feeling tears well up. Poor little Lewis. William Adams, the director, looked at the floor momentarily. The assistant carer of the nursery didn't know about our little arrangement. Gloria had foolishly left her in charge while she popped out. She was under orders never to do that while a child is infected. If only the assistant carer had not panicked when she saw what was happening to Lewis. We would have cured him in less than an hour later. And if you and Alan hadn't interfered, hadn't asked too many questions, hadn't stirred the pot with the police, hadn't allowed all this press attention, maybe we'd have been able to discreetly give Lewis the antidote. But now too many questions are being asked, so we'll have to do what we have done before. Little Lewis will die in the next 24 hours. We shall see to it over the next couple of days that his father's condition gets worse. And in the next half an hour, you will have an unfortunate accident on the New York subway seven blocks from here. Michael will make sure of it. Lucy turned around and saw Michael had trained a gun on her. If it's any consolation, Adams continued, your life ending will also be a significant contribution to the human victory in the war on cancer. And with that, Michael grabbed Lucy's arm and pulled her away from the director and towards an elevator on the far end of the room. He's taking me out the back way. This is it. With all the strength she could gather, Lucy pulled away from Michael, but 
He was strong, unflappable. She tried to twist from his grip, but it was all in vain. Then she turned and bit his hand. Michael cried out in agony. Adams turned, slightly concerned. It was just the right moment. Lucy grabbed Michael's pistol and with the butt of the gun hit him hard in the face with as much force as possible. He went down right away. Had she killed him? Or was he just out cold? The director froze. She trained the gun on him. She had never fired one before, didn't even know how, but that didn't matter. The look in his eyes was clear. He believed that she intended to use it. Give me the antidote. Now! She was almost surprised at the hatred in her voice. He passed it to her cautiously. Please, understand. This is futile. You'll never get out of here. She pulled the trigger. The blast sent her back a step. She had shot Adams in the shoulder. He was writhing in agony. Lucy ran to the elevator she came up in. The doors opened, but there was no buttons inside, just the card slot. The card! She ran back to Michael's lifeless body and searched in his pockets. She found it, waiting for the elevator to get back to the lobby, running past security, sprinting past the official sounding voices telling her to stop immediately. Running out of the reception, it was all a blur. She just had to get out, get into the bustle of New York City commuters. She was surrounded by a sea of people, all making their way to work. The city is my camouflage. She just kept walking, unsure of where to go. The hospital. Little Lewis needs the antidote. But I need to take one detour first. Alan was still waking up from his fever dream. Nothing seemed right. He had seen his wife. She told him that she'd sent him an angel to keep them both safe. Then he could hear Lewis, that beautiful, happy baby, giggling like he always used to. After a moment, he knew he was awake. But Lewis kept on giggling. He wasn't imagining it. And there he was, as happy as always. No purple blotches, no tubes running up his nose. He wasn't hooked up to machines anymore. The doctor was there, telling him about a full recovery. No traces of the infection could be found. He was telling Alan how they were baffled. They'd need to keep him in for further tests, but everything seemed to be okay. And there she was, Lucy, smiling, squeezing Alan's hand tight. Lucy, what did his wife say in the dream? I've sent an angel to keep you safe. The TV was on. It was the local news. An old man, bald, but for a bit of white hair on the sides and with his arm in a sling called William Adams, was being escorted out of the Marvelox building by Detective Johnson. Lucy watched the TV too. She saw the director being escorted out and into the police car. Their nightmare was over, but only she knew it. In time, when he was ready to hear it, she'd tell Alan all about what happened about how before getting back to the hospital she burst into Detective Johnson's office and told him what was going on. Johnson had asked, Do you have any evidence or are you just clutching a conspiratorial straws again, miss? Always the cynic. She had handed him her dictaphone, the one her last boyfriend bought her to help her with learning French. He played back their entire conversation with William Adams, Director of Biological Advancement at the Marvelox Corporation. Johnson finally took her seriously. She had a police escort to the hospital. After a very brief test of the antidote, it was administered to Lewis. Within 12 minutes, he was back to full health, like nothing had ever happened. Lucy kissed Alan on the cheek. Both her men were going to be okay. She smiled at him. So, have you ever thought about a trip to Paris? That was Antidote, story one from Everything in Seven Stories, written by Andy Jones and narrated by the author. This is a Gold Pictures production. <laughs>